everybody. Oh, this does feel good. I heard Natalie say that, and now I'm feeling it. Um, thanks for being here for our 2022 summit. The last time we did this was 2019, and it was a really joyful convergence of our community, and I'm so excited. Yeah, that's good. Then. Let's not put everybody to sleep this morning. Um, I'm excited to do it again here. Uh, I find that this is also a really great time for us to both look backward and reflect on where we've come and then look ahead and tell you where we planned ahead so that you can bring us feedback, perspectives, comments, and really inform where we take this community. Um, so I want to spend this morning doing exactly that, and I want to do it from the eyes of the workforce, which is where Guild derives nearly all of our questions and certainly all of our answers. So I want to start with Jesse. Jesse's parents immigrated from Mexico to the United States just before he was born. He, at age 18, like so many, entered the workforce, uh, joining a big box retailer, though not one here represented today, and that's important and you'll see why, um, as a parking lot attendant, making $8.35 an hour. After a few years of working quite hard, he moved into the store where he earned a salary of $55,000 a year, which felt pretty good to him. It wasn't the end of the road for someone as ambitious as Jesse, but a huge step up. When he did that, he went to his manager and said, hey, I've been putting myself back to school. I've been working nights and weekends. I'd really like Tuesdays and Thursdays off so I can take classes at Cal State LA. As you all probably know, most in-person schools offer most of their classes, close to 80%, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., Monday through Friday. So if you're a working adult, you got a puzzle to figure out. Jesse's manager said, oh, well, if I knew you wanted to go back to school, I don't think I would have given you that promotion. Jesse's not the only person who hears answers like that. But Jesse persisted. He took that. He put his head down. His wife had already accumulated $25,000 in her own student loan debt, so he just kept working. Worked 16-hour days sometimes, worked nearly six days a week for most of the next 18 months. And then he went back to his manager, and he even brought his keys this time. And he said, I really want to go back to school. I need Tuesdays and Thursdays off. You know, put up or shut up. Here are my keys. I'll walk out. And his man, he thought his manager would say, like, hey, Jesse, let's take a step back. We'll make this work. And instead, his manager let him resign. You guys are used to me hearing, telling me inspirational stories. Like, this is a, a difficult one. But I, we need to talk about it because Jesse's experience is really all too ubiquitous. It's not an anecdote. So we're going to do some quick market math. We have 300 million Americans in the US. 150 million go to work every day. Used to be 160 pre-COVID, we're now hovering around 150. Let's talk about where that group is in terms of their education. 23% of our workforce, that's 36 million Americans, have a bachelor's degree. Next up, 14% have completed an advanced degree or a master's or doctorate. Then you've got 10.5% who have an associate's degree, whether that's an applied or an academic. Pause there. Then you've got 15% who have some college or no degree. That's actually the worst bucket to be in, I think, because that means you've probably got debt and no degree to show for it. Let's keep moving. 28% of the workforce, 42 million Americans, have only a high school diploma. And those folks get forgotten so often because we don't ask that question on the job application anymore, but it doesn't mean it doesn't matter. And then lastly, 9% of the workforce the folks between 18 and 64 who go to work every day don't even have a high school diploma. So what does that mean? It means 48% of our workforce don't have the skills they need today, and less than a third have the skills they need when we look out 5, 10, 15 years into jobs of the future. I think that's pretty stark, but I bet there's some of you who are doing the but, but, but. Who needs degrees? Like, we're in a skills economy now, right? No. Let me tell you about that. So at Guild, we believe the credential is basically a container. Pick a degree, pick a certificate, pick a boot camp. We think those are all effectively a relevant container of skills, and I often call it the Tupperware, right? What matters less than the Tupperware is what's in it. Those are skills. So degrees have been the container of choice for the post-World War II transition from the industrial to the knowledge economy, right? And it served a lot of value. We can all reflect on the value there, but we're in this moment of reflecting on the downstream implications. That's been the crushing student debt that we've watched Americans accumulate. That's been things like the mistrust in higher education that's growing right now in lots of communities around the US. So 
We're huge advocates of the emergence of new containers, whether that be certificates or boot camps. But the reality is, regardless of the container, we have 100 million Americans who don't have the skills to survive in the future of work. So we probably need to move away from this like false choice of degree or no degree. Like the answer regardless is skills. So in 2013, the work that undergirded all of what is now Guild today, the research was around this skills challenge. And just to hark back, it hasn't been that long, but in 2013, lots of academics were still, not, not the academics here, but lots of academics in ivory towers were debating like, is there a skills gap? Maybe we have plenty of engineers. Like, here we are. <laughs> We don't, a <laughs> surprise. We also don't have enough nurses. We also actually don't have enough truck drivers like Peter Thiel and Elon Musk got that one wrong too. Like we have a problem related to the skills for today's jobs and a massive problem for tomorrow's jobs. That said, we've adjusted to that change in the last 10 years. The change we haven't talked about as much is how the workforce has come to understand that data. 10 years ago, it was really rare for a worker to understand hey, this uh, cashierless agenda of the Fortune 500 is coming. But today, that worker is working in a store who sees the automated cashier that's coming in. They, the average worker didn't understand the predominance of software that was going to advance their future day-to-day -day job, and now they're actually watching those tools get implemented, and they're wondering, is this software going to automate me or advance me? And lastly, jobs felt really linear 10 years ago to the average worker, even if that line ended up in a brick wall. Whereas today, the emergence of nonlinear job pathways, which Josh spoke about yesterday and will emphasize, I'm sure, again today, are really exciting to workers, but also very unclear and scary. So this shift from ignorance to awareness um, that workers are going through right now has both benefits and costs. There's an awakening that's leading to both optimism and fear for the frontline worker. Um, what we believe at Guild and what we've been talking about for the last year is we think there's basically three things the workforce is asking for today. First is pay. Hopefully that's quite obvious, but just to remind us, in the push for the $15 an hour wage, over the course of the four quarters of 2021, the average worker saw more wage gains than at any other point in the last 40 years. Four quarters in 2021 to 40 years. Pretty remarkable, right? What that means is much like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs, folks who maybe for the first time feel like they're at a sustainable pay are looking up and saying, well, what next should I ask for from my work? We think that next thing is purpose. Today, 70% of employees say they derive the purpose in their life from their work. And that's the highest we've seen in that statistic in modern American history. We had a great conversation yesterday with a number of leaders about what do you do with that? Um, but the data is something we've got to reckon with. Purpose can come from lots of places, a caring manager, a community of coworkers, a mission that inspires, but the workforce is asking for it. And then lastly, workers have been asking for pathways. Uh, career pathways were once the stair step to the American dream, and then they started slipping away since the 1980s. And I think our friend David Gellis is gonna talk about some of why that happened and some of how we fix it. Today, 76% of Americans feel like they don't have the skills to advance to the next job. That is way higher than we've seen in any other point. And only 26% of them feel like they have a pathway or know where to even go get those skills, right? So that last piece, the pathways piece, has felt like the misunderstood piece of the puzzle to Guild for the last year. We offer uh, Guild now to, as Natalie mentioned, um, close to six million Americans. We talk to hundreds of thousands every month and we interact with tens of thousands every day. And for us, we've been reading these headlines about the great resignation and quiet quitting and all the reasons behind it. And they didn't quite resonate with what we hear every single day. And so that's why we went out and put a big survey into the field. We, uh, in our new research report that's launching today, so you're getting live, brand new data here in this moment, uh, we spent time with 1,867 American workers, those both in our Guild community and outside of it, and we asked what's driving them. And here was the key takeaway from the survey. It's not quiet quitting, it's not the great resignation, we actually think the media got this wrong. The number one reason employees left a job in the last year was lack of career development and advancement opportunities. I see you all head nodding, so that makes me feel good. But it, we've not read those headlines, right? So let's talk about it a little bit. Frontline workers actually don't wanna leave their job. 
In fact, if they're going to stay and they want to stay, they just want to know they can learn and grow. Workers are begging for pathways, but many employers aren't listening. So here are some of the key insights we found in our survey. So 69% of workers want to be at the company they're at today two to five years from now. I think that's, that's quite a good thing for what our economy is dealing with right now. Of that group, nearly half say the desire to stay will hinge on whether they see a pathway to grow in those next two to five years. So that really resonates for us that the pundits sort of got this one wrong. 78% of the workers we spoke with said that they have significant challenges trying to advance their skills right now. 47% uh, said they lack training programs and education pathways. We're all here to talk about that. Another 26% said, I just simply don't have the network or connections to move beyond the store or this small location I'm in, even though I know my company is global and has locations and headquarters and jobs all over. I don't even know how to access that. And lastly, 89% of workers said that having a career path is important to them. And that's the data we've been feeling in our bones but lacking in any statistically significant way. What we know is that 75% of workers, three and four, say that the reason they would leave their company, and reminder, 69% don't want to, but three and four would leave their company if they could move to another job that offers career development and education opportunities. So safe to say we feel like we have our work cut out for us at Guild with all of you. And we're excited to share that research report with you um, throughout the next few days and, and to share digitally for you to keep. So from day one at Guild, we've been trying to figure out how to bridge the pathway between education and employment. You all know that. Our origins and where we got started, visualized on this cute little slide, um, are really oriented around a few things. We knew that the American workforce wanted to go back to school. And in 2015, when we started, employers were open to that, but in a pretty narrow way. The two most innovative companies in the country at that point, Starbucks and Chipotle, were offering bachelor's degrees fully funded for their workforce. That was it. And the way they were doing that was through tuition assistance, and we got to partner with Chipotle and Maurice's team to innovate on that. But nearly everybody else was doing tuition reimbursement. So we had the opportunity to prototype on a payment model, and thanks to all the universities in the room who prototyped that with us, so that no worker had to pay up front to go back to school. And we were really proud of that work. But we also learned that at places like Starbucks that had partnered with a single school, 40% of the workforce who wanted to go back didn't even get accepted to that one single school. So we realized we needed to build a learning marketplace, and that's what started our path to adding many universities and a real diversity of choice for the frontline worker. That was act one, right? But this was 2015, and as mentioned, not everybody was ready to talk about skills. Over time, and thanks to some of our friends in the room like Disney and Walmart and others who in 2017 and 18 really started to have the conversation about credentials and certificates. So as we added those, we saw there was a real opportunity to innovate around skills. And that ties back to the data that I shared of we know that regardless of the container, we need to be delivering skills to the workforce. Let me pause there. We all know education and skilling, and you've heard, if you're in this room, you believe in it, are two critical ingredients to the workforce, right? But the crisis surrounding uh, the skills gap and then moving forward into economic opportunity became really clear to us. And I want to pause and share something that we don't talk about enough at Guild, which is for every one learner we spend time with, the learner that is the employee at these companies, as well as the uh, learner for our universities in your, and learning providers in your classrooms. For every one learner we spend time with, we actually spend time with 30 additional employees. The reason I share that is because as we think about it, delivering on economic opportunity for learners also requires full-blown career pathways, and even the people who aren't in the classroom are valuing the work we're doing around career. So I want to share with you where we're headed with Guild. This slide represents the new groups that we're adding to our ecosystem. So as I talk about that one learner and those 30 additional employees, those are Guild's members. And as we think about our members, we're building a tech platform that can unlock opportunity for all of our learners. We talk to retail clerks every day who aren't quite ready to go back to school because their youngest hasn't even reached kindergarten and they feel like they can't quite make that leap. 
We talk to call center agents who actually have the skills they already need to move up in your companies. They just don't know how to go interview and have that conversation with their manager. They don't even know what job they should interview for because they're not fully aware of the skills they've acquired from your job and your training. We talk to so many RNs who are under suffocating student debt and say like, yes, of course I wanna go back to school. And I know it's fully funded to get that bachelor's or to get that next certificate, but I just don't even have the financial security right now to take that leap and make that emotional investment in myself. So the, the broad takeaway is every day we're talking to folks who've absorbed this message that the middle class and the jobs in the middle class are a dream for somebody else, not for me. And what they really need is a conversation and a community to make that leap. So, this is where Guild's third phase is headed. We believe we can create as much value as we're creating for the learners for those other 30 employees who aren't ready to jump into the classroom. Tactically, it's showing up in our data that that creates value for them and for all of you. We're finding that we can further a company's recruitment and retention rates by spending time with people who aren't ready to go back to school or might never. We're finding that we can deepen talent pipelines and increase the career mobility. This also pays dividends to the universities and learning providers we work with because we're helping people understand many years before they're ready to go back to school what skilling might look like because this workforce is going to skill five to six times in their lifetime. So having that conversation today is okay even if they're not going to go back to school for many years. Let's talk about what the value we hope to create for our learning partners in the room. We want to help improve career services. And y'all do it better than most, but I like to pull people on who've, who has felt like they had a great career services experience at their prior university. Let's see a round of hands. Okay, one, there you go. <laughs> I can't, is that Kenny? Oh, okay, why does that not surprise me? Because you know the last person who raised their hand had gone to Spelman, so there is something unique happening in the HBCUs, but other than that, nobody ever raises their hands. So, um, as we think about what it, that looks like, it also looks like introducing new ecosystem partners. And at Guild, we built our bones on a learning marketplace, but we've realized we can take those same capabilities and welcome new partners, some who are here in this room today, to add things like career services and assessments, student loan repayment and retooling, apprenticeship models, affordable access to textbooks, and partners who are gonna innovate on how do we translate the training that happens at work to the training that can be rewarded and honored in your career. You're gonna hear more from Bijal about our career mobility roadmap tomorrow, but it's safe to say we're really excited about this work and where we're headed. All right, let's bring it home. Remember Jesse? I have good news about him. He had to leave his company to find a path forward, but he found a place who valued him and his career advancement. Jesse now works at Sam's Club, and he's on a path to complete a fully funded bachelor's degree in business management. He wants to have an impact and serve the community he's in. And as he said, there's nothing that's going to stop me. Yeah, high fives for that table. That I was, gonna, I was about to say cheers <laughs> to the Walmart and Sam's Club team who's made Jesse and, and thousands and tens of thousands of dreams possible. Um, Natalie talked about her why. Stories like Jesse's are what get me out of bed every morning. But the volume of stories we now get to hear are what power my days. I want to tell you about a few more folks. This is Keisha. She was trying to meet ends, make ends meet as a single mom working two jobs in 2011 when a friend told her about JP Morgan and said, this is a place you can come in at the entry level, but they'll give you skills. She applied and started as a collection agent on the phone and then earned a certificate in digital marketing. Today, she got a much better job and a salary bump as a feedback analyst, and she's applying that learning but she also stacked that certificate into a full-blown bachelor's degree with Wilmington University in marketing. She's on her path forward, so cheers to the JP Morgan team for making that happen. Um, next, this one's cool. This is Renee and her husband, Rodney. He's worked at WM for uh, 28 years. He's a swing driver, sometimes works overtime shifts, trying to fill up their savings account to support their family, and he's also managing diabetes. He wants to retire as a driver, but he gets competing job offers just about weekly given that truck driver shortage. When his wife Renee heard about WM's really groundbreaking program to offer education to dependents and family members, Renee said, all right, our family's gonna make a commitment to WM. She's now earning her accounting degree, gonna pursue a career in finance, and she shared, I want Rodney to feel less pressure to work such a demanding schedule to take a day off every, every once in a while, and I want to contribute to our family's savings. 
She also said he will be at WM until she completes that degree. So he's not going anywhere. Um, thanks to Gordon at WM and Tamla WM alums who launched what is truly a first of its kind education program for dependents and family members. And lastly, I want to talk about Krista. Krista is someone I really admire. She started at Walmart 10 years ago in an overnight shift in Clinton, Arkansas, population 2,500. That's relevant because in a town that size, she picked her head up after high school and she looked, she saw two jobs, Walmart and the local hospital. She picked Walmart on that overnight shift, worked her way up over 10 years to pharmacy assistant, excuse me, pharmacy technician, and that role is still in the teens on a dollar, on a dollar an hour basis. Turns out when Walmart launched the Live Better You program, she took an assessment and what we and Krista learned is she's a software wizard. She's like the millions of Americans who are called diamonds in the rough, hiding in towns like Clinton, Arkansas, who are completely capable of coding just like a bro in Silicon Valley. She was uh, quick to complete her bachelor's in cybersecurity to move into the corporate office and she was just recently promoted to software engineer, making an X factor more than she did in that role as a pharmacy technician. She shared with us, and I love this quote, someone like me doesn't necessarily think that there's ever gonna be a chance to get your hand on that rung so you can climb the corporate ladder. But a program like this is the one thing that makes it possible. So cheers to the whole team for making Krista's dream possible too. Yeah. So, uh, we have the blessing of working with 5 million Americans, just like Jesse and Renee and Krista. And as we look ahead, we're really motivated by the fact that we're just getting warmed up. There are 100 million Americans who need what we do. With that, we can't do it alone. We need a community and ecosystem, um, and we need you to warm up with us. So uh, I want to thank you all for being here this week, and I want to thank you for doing the work. Here's to what's ahead. Thank you.